Welcome to episode 7 of Behind the Music, a video series where I, along with other incredible young musicians, talk a little bit about our craft. This episode will feature the wonderful cellist Davis Yu. He'll be talking us through one of Bach's pieces that he's working on at the moment. Now before we get started, I'd like to note that this episode was originally going to be on the entire Bach piece. However, after recording too much footage, we decided to split it into multiple episodes. So without further ado, we hope you enjoy. I got to meet Davis during From the Top back in 2019, and it was an absolute privilege. So thank you so much for joining us today, Davis. And uh, why don't you introduce yourself a bit? Thanks for having me, Eric. A little bit about me. Well, I'm 19. I'm currently a first year student at the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. However, because of the whole pandemic situation right now, I'm in, at my home here in uh, Palo Alto, California, just a, maybe a half an hour's drive from Eric. I've been studying with the Professor Lawrence Lesser, um, and I play the cello. <laughs> Yeah, I think we can see that. <laughs> yeah. What piece will you be playing for us today? I was hoping today we could discuss a little bit the fifth cello suite of Bach. He wrote um, he wrote six of them. This is the fifth one in C minor. Quite a bit more somber and dark compared to the other five. About the composer of Bach, what kind of things do you notice about this cello suite represents something he normally does? Well, actually, we can talk a little bit about the structure of the suite because he does this in a lot of different... Um, a lot of different suites, a lot of different for a lot of different instruments. For example, violin. He wrote partitas and sonatas. They kind of follow this kind of same idea of a collection of pieces, often with a prelude and then a bunch of dance movements after that. So this this fifth suite, it's a prelude and then an allemand, a courant, a sarabande, two gavots, and a gigue to make out a sixth movement piece. So that's very typical of Bach. For example, in the in the first movie, we have something Bach is very famous for, and that is the fugue. About like 75% of the first movement is a fugue, which is interesting because fugues are usually in three, four voices, and we can only really play one at the cello. But he does this so masterfully. It's something Bach can really do well, is write in a fugue for, for really any instrument. One of the places that stands out to me in the first movement is towards the very end, and he has deceptive cadence, which means instead of resolving on on one, um, the tonic, he uh, he goes. We expect the piece to end there, but because of this deceptive cadence, it allows him to just uh, you know keep on going. He still has a little bit more to say. I can just play a few measures of that for you, I think it's a really striking part of the piece. And then he keeps on going for another minute or so. It's something Bach does a lot, and actually a lot of composers after him copy this technique too of a, um, a deceptive cadence and totally switching the character. It's a very surprising um, moment, something that definitely sticks out to you. In the entire suite. I never really noticed that when listening to this piece before. Well you know why? It's because it's not actually written in here. The problem with a lot of with all of Bach's suites for cello is we don't have his original um, manuscript. We just have copies by his, his wife Anna Magdalena um, and you know a number of other copyists. What we do have is an arrangement of the suite for the lute and it's transposed in G minor. Eric I think you've You've played a movement or two from it. And in in that, in the lute suite, you, we do have the deceptive cadence, the A flat on the bottom, that makes it deceptive. Whereas in the cello suite, I, I hear, this is what the cello suite would sound like. So you can't, it's a totally different thing. You would almost expect it to be. And then the piece could end, but adding the A flat, Adding the A flat at the bottom, um, which is what he does in the lute suite, um, totally, totally changes everything. Okay, so now I'm kind of intrigued. What are the differences between the cello suite and the lute suite in G minor? Besides, obviously, that they're in different keys, it's mostly the same. Um, it's this, basically the same 
melody, but I will occasionally have, like I demonstrated, in a new bass note or a new harmony. Um, sometimes the voices are just a little bit different. I'm playing off of a transcription that my teacher, Lawrence Lesser, made of the lute suite, but back onto the cello. So, for example, in the fugue's a great place, right? Because fugue on a cello, we can really only play one note. In the fugue, he's able to, on the lute, do many more voices at once. I'll, I'll play what the cello version sounds like at this uh, beginning of the fugue. <laughs> That's the first, uh, yeah. first subject, first voice. That's unchanged in the lute suite. But then, that is the second voice. That's what it would be like in the cello version. But on the lute, he's able to add another voice under it, which is the continuation of the first voice. So the effect is, like a few, we have two voices going at once, and this is what it sounds like in the loop version. And so you can hear there's a, a whole other bass line, and that would be the first voice. Uh, that's a great example of a key difference between the loop suite and the original cello version. Fitting in again with this idea of a, a fugue, Bach has to eventually end it, of course, and and so he um, he beautifully is able to kind of converge all the voices at the end because by the end we have at least two voices, maybe three or four, maybe five. It's impossible to know because we can only really play one at a time on the cello. I'll play an example of this. So we have a high voice and a low voice in this uh, final part. That's the high voice. And that's the low voice, and of course, those are from the original fugal theme. I mentioned there was a deceptive cadence earlier, but now, finally we're home. This is an authentic cadence, ending on, um, ending on the tonic. And everything after that is just Tim wrapping up the movement. He has a bunch of chords. That's basically uh, what I think is really cool about the ending of this piece. Thank you.